Okay, so this is the final video for the new member 2017 ID Chemistry Paper 1. So we've got questions 31 to 40. So we're still on redox at the moment. So what are the products when an aqueous solution of copper 2 sulfate is electrolyzed using inert graphite electrodes? So it's an aqueous solution. So what have we got swimming around? We've got copper 2 plus and H plus because of course water can dissociate into H plus and OH minus ions. And then what else have we got? Well, we've got the sulfate ions and we've got the uh, OH minus ions. So opposites attract. So the positive ions will be attracted to the negative electrode. So what are we going to get? Copper or hydrogen? Well, we get whichever one is lowest in the reactivity series. Because basically the lower it is in the reactivity series, the less happy it is being a positive ion. So the copper is less reactive than hydrogen. So copper will be discharged. It will lose its charge. So copper 2 plus would gain two electrons and form copper metal. Okay? So we don't usually get the metal, but there's not that many metals which are less reactive than hydrogen. Uh, so it's going to be copper or copper, one of those two. And then we've got a choice of the two negative ions then. Well, the rule is generally halide beats hydroxide, hydroxide beats anything else. Technically, hydroxide does beat a halide, but unless it's a very, very, very dilute solution of the halide, uh, then we, the halide will still win. So hydroxide is discharged to, in preference to anything else. Sulfate counts as anything else because, of course, halide would be F minus, Cl minus, Br minus, or I minus, the halogen uh, ions, or halide ions. So the, what happens in this case is four hydroxide ions will give you a molecule of oxygen, two waters, and four electrons. So we're going to get oxygen gas. We're not going to see a bit of water being produced, but we get bubbles of oxygen gas. So that's that one and that one. So which one has them both? That will be C. 32. Uh, what are the oxidation states of chromium in ammonium dichromate and uh, chromium oxide? So this one, we give ourselves a bit of a head start if we know that it's the dichromate ion, because NH4 plus has a 1 plus charge, there's two of them, so this thing must be Cr2072 minus, because I say it's NH4 plus, there's basically two of those. That'll simplify it down a bit, because then uh, we've only got to work out the oxidation numbers here. So of course oxygen is minus 2, there's 7 of them, so that would bring it down to minus 14. We have a 2 minus charge overall, so something must bring it back by plus 12. So minus 14 is brought back by plus 12. Plus 12 divided by the two chromiums would be plus 6 each. So it's plus 6 for the chromium there. For the chromium here, I don't know why I've done that. I should have just worked it. So the chromium again, minus 2. 3 times minus 2 is minus 6. It's neutral overall, so the chromiums must bring it back by plus 6 to 0. Plus 6 divided by the 2, that would be their each plus 3. Okay, so plus 3, plus 3, uh, plus 6, plus 6. The two that match up will be B, or 32. On to organic chemistry then. So propene reacts separately with uh, water in the presence of acid. Remember, that would be a steam and phosphoric acid catalyst at 300 degrees. And hydrogen and nickel. Nickel catalyst, uh, I think that would be 150 degrees uh, that they quote for the ID. So this is basically just going to reduce it. So what we're going to get over here will be CH3, CH2, CH3. We're just going to reduce it to the alkane. Okay, so that's going to be that one or that one, because we just add hydrogen across two double bonds. Here's another addition reaction. Now, this one could give two possible products, because, of course, uh, if I just kind of sketch it out like this, well, when that reacts with the water, which it would react with H+, plus, uh, but uh, this will simplify it down, plus delta minus, that bond breaks. Well, that gives two possible carbocations. That could give the carbocation there or the carbocation here. This one is more stable because it's more substituted. It's a secondary carbocation, whereas this one is a primary carbocation, so it's less stable. When the OH- minus comes in, that will react with that plus to give this alcohol. When this one reacts, the OH- minus will come in here to give that alcohol. So it's propan 2 o this is propan 1 all. Okay, This one's more stable because those two carbons can donate electron density towards the carbocation and help to stabilize it. In this one, we've only got one carbon directly attached, so it can't donate as much electron density. So what's the match on the other one then? So this is going to be the major product. So we're looking for propan 2 all, which will be uh, there's propan 2 all and there's propan 2 all there. Propan 1-ol is not 
the major isomer as the minor one. And this one's wrong anyway. We're not going to get propyne uh, and we're certainly not going to oxidize it uh, to a ketone. So we're looking at answer A. Okay. 34. What is the name of this compound using IUPAC rules? So look for the longest chain. It's a, we can see it's an alcohol. The longest chain, we keep the numbers as small as possible. It doesn't matter which of these we start from. Call that carbon 1, 2, 3, and 4. So there's uh, the alcohols on carbon 2, so it's going to be butan 2 all. And then we've also got this extra methyl group, this CH3 group here. So that will be 2 methyl butan 2 all. Okay, here's our methyl group and our alcohol. So 2 methyl butan 2 all. What is the product of the reaction between pentan 2 and sodium borohydride, NaBH4? Well, if we sketch 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there's uh, pentan, uh, pentane. So let's convert that into pentan 2 by putting our ketone onto position 2. When we reduce that with sodium borohydride, that reduces ketones and aldehydes to alcohols. So that would be position 1, that would be position 2. So it's pentan 2 Okay, so if it had been pentanal, if it had been an aldehyde, we'd go pentan 1 ol. Uh, and then, yeah, these are both oxidation products of pentan 1 ol, basically. So if you oxidize pentan 1 ol, you get pentanal, and then you can take it on to pentanoic acid. Uh, so that's a different reaction using dichromate instead. Okay, so these would be reactions with Cr2O7 and some H plus as well. So pentan 2 ol. Which compound can be oxidized when heated with an acidified solution, a potassium dichromate? So we always need the acid in there. Uh, that's why it specifies acidified. Well, what we've got here, again, if you sketch them out, you might make your life easier, is butan 2 ohm. That's a ketone. It's already fully oxidized. So that's not going to work. What have we got here? Let's sketch this one out a bit further away. So we've got one, two, three carbons, and then there's an OH. And then we've got a fourth carbon, so this would be butan 2 ol. So this will oxidize, actually. That would oxidize to give uh, the ketone uh, with uh, potassium dichromate and a bit of acid. So this looks like the winner. Let's just rule these out. So this is a tertiary alcohol. You can't oxidize those because there's no hydrogen uh, to remove on this carbon. So tertiary, that doesn't work. And then this is a carboxylic acid. Well, that's already fully oxidized, just to kind of sketch it out. That's one, two, three. Oh, that's a slightly confusing way of doing it. One, two, three. That, basically. Uh, so that's a butanoic acid. That's already fully oxidized. It can't oxidize any further. So B is our right answer. The secondary alcohol will oxidize to a ketone. Uh, 37, what is the number of optical isomers of isoleucine? So how many enantiomers can you get? Uh, well, you can also get, when you've got two chiral centers, you can get what's known as diastereoisomers then, which are kind of consist of pairs of enantiomers. There is a quick and easy shortcut, which as long as you know the number of chiral centers, you can work out how many possible isomers there are. And that's basically two to the power N, where N is your number of chiral centers. So we've got a chiral center here. We can mask that with an asterisk because, of course, there's a hydrogen there. So that's four different groups attached to this carbon, this, this, the amino group, the carboxylic acid, this alkyl chain and the hydrogen. And we've also got a chiral center on this carbon because it's got a methyl group, an ethyl group, and then this other group plus the hydrogen. So that's two chiral centers. So that's uh, basically two to the power two, which is two times two, which is four. So that's four possible enantiomers. Okay. Uh, which functional group is responsible for the PKB of 4.1 in this compound? So basically it's asking, right, which group makes this a base or basic? Well, uh, in the organic chemistry, we're always looking for amines. The amines are basic because, of course, you've got a lone pair on the nitrogen, which can then pick up a proton and give you uh, the protonated amine. Or positive charge, okay, specifically on nitrogen. So we're looking for the amino group, and we can see here we've got our amino group. So it's a tertiary amine because there's three carbons attached to it, but it's got the lone pair of electrons on there. So that's what will allow it to act as a base. So we're looking for B, okay. 
Uh, there's also another amino group down here that would be a little less basic because it's attached to a benzene ring so the lone pair of electrons can delocalize into the ring and therefore it will be a poorer base or a weaker base than the tertiary alpha the amine over here we can see here's the amide group well that tends to be uh pretty they're not basic and that's because yes there's a lone pair on the nitrogen but rather than reacting with protons it's more interested in delocalizing onto the uh, the carbon oxygen double bond uh, so these tend to be uh, amides and not basic. So we're sticking with the amino group there. Uh, I can't see a chloro or a nefer in there, but they're not basic anyway. They're all acidic. They're just neutral. Uh, 39, which compound gives proton NMR spectrum shown below? Uh, so we can see we've got four peaks. So that's four different hydrogen environments. So what about this first one? Well, again, if we kind of have a look at this one, there's a plane of symmetry there. So basically, if you kind of sketch that out like that, you're only expecting two peaks because you'd have a hydrogen environment for that one. And then if I sort of use a different color, you'd have a hydrogen environment for those two. So you'd get two peaks. And the ratio would be uh, four to six. Because you've got two hydrogens on here, two there, and then three there, three there, four to six, which you could then equate that to two to three, okay? We won't go into the splitting pattern just yet. I'll explain a bit more on that because I don't want the question to take too long. Ethanol itself, we'd be looking at three peaks. We'd have a peak for those three hydrogens, then those two hydrogens, and then a third peak for EOH. This one here, we'd also have three peaks. Uh, so we'd have a peak, sorry, two peaks. Because again, we've got the plane of symmetry. So these three hydrogens would come in the same region. And then you'd have those two hydrogens. So again, it's because of the symmetry. If you kind of sketch it out like that, then you'd have six hydrogens and two hydrogens there. So your two peaks would be in a uh, six to two ratio or three to one. Okay, so three to one for those to that. Uh, the last one then, so hopefully it's this one, because so far we've quickly eliminated the others just because they won't give us four peaks. So this is propanol. So I'll sketch this one out above a bit more closely and then maybe label it so you can kind of see what's going on. So here's propanol. So matching this up with the spectrum, we can see we've got, I haven't got enough pens uh, to give the different ones. I'll just sort of do it. Okay, so that's one hydrogen environment. Uh, I'll do this one as another hydrogen environment. I might just do dotted lines around that one. And then dotted line around that one. And then we can kind of match these up with the relevant bits. So uh, there's no integration, so we can't see the relative peak height. But this one, which will be furthest to the right, uh, here will be the CH3 here. This is split by two neighboring protons, so it's split to form a triplet because there's two hydrogens on the carbon next door. So the N plus one rule, two plus one is three. So that appears as a triplet and that would be there. Uh, this one here, well, that's uh, in between them. So that's gonna be a little further to the left. It's in between two carbons and that's gonna be split into something a bit more complicated. It's split by the three protons there plus two there. So that's five protons plus one. So that would be uh, six. So that's why it's looking more complicated. It's like a hextet. So this would be, let's come underneath and link it to that one. So again, this would be two protons and it's actually appearing as a hextet. Although in reality, I'd probably call that more a, uh, a triplet of quartets. Uh, but that's getting way beyond what we need here. Uh, this one here will be that one, uh, when they're attached to a carbon which is attached to an oxygen, it's very de-shielding, so they're very far down on the left here. Uh, so that would be these two, and then with the splitting pattern, again, there's two hydrogens next door. I know there's a hydrogen on the oxygen, but they don't usually couple to that. So it's just coupling with these ones here, which the N plus one rule again is two plus one. So this is appearing as a triplet. And then finally, our alcohol, uh, if that can jump around an awful lot, that must be this one down here. Uh, like I say, it can become anywhere between like sort of one and six pretty much. Uh, so that would be uh, this one here, which again appearing as a singlet because it doesn't often show coupling. Remember, if you wanted to verify that was the alcohol, you could add a few drops of D2O, which is deuterium oxide, and they would uh, remove that as an exchangeable proton and swap it for deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen, which doesn't show up in the NMR spectrum. But it won't swap out the others because they're not exchangeable. They don't like to come off the carbons. 
So I'll go with answer D, uh, quite a full explanation there, but we could have easily got it just by the number of peaks. It's the only one that can give you four peaks, so you wouldn't even have to worry about the chemical shifts and the uh, multiplicity, uh, because of course you, you don't have the data booklet, so the chemical shifts, you'd be going with your own knowledge. And then number 40, a student performs an acid-base titration using a pH meter but forgets to calibrate it. Which type of error will occur and how will it affect the quality of the measurements? Uh, so basically, if he's forgotten to calibrate it, let's imagine that is okay. As a result, his pH is always one unit higher than it should be. Now, that means it's going to be a systematic error because it always op operates in one direction. If the pH meter is incorrectly calibrated, so it's going one pH unit higher than it should do, then that's going to be consistent. So we're going to rule out random error because, of course, that's where it could be too high or too low. So we've got a systematic error. And then, uh, well, the precision then, so like uh, he should be getting the same results every time. It's just that they won't be particularly accurate. They'll always be, let's say, that one pH unit higher than they should actually be. So we want to go with systematic error and lower accuracy, okay? Because if it's consistently one pH unit higher than it should be, then his precision should be, uh, or her precision should be pretty good. So we're going to go with B, okay? And that's the end of that paper, folks. Hope you found that useful.